Dr. Stephen Meyer is a geophysicist and Cambridge University PhD in philosophy of science. He is a New York Times best-selling author and director of the Center for Science and Culture. I'm going to talk, as John mentioned, this hour about the argument, the thesis of the book Signature in the Cell. And um, the book was published in 2009, which was an interesting year because it was the 150th anniversary of the origin of species and the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. And so in that year, there was a lot of media uh, stories about Darwin's legacy and scholars and journalists and others asking, well, what is the legacy of Darwinism? And uh, I had the chance in 2009 to speak in the United Kingdom in February, which was the month of Darwin's birth at a Darwin bicentennial birth celebration. And uh, I thought it was, it was Shrewsbury, but the British pronounce it Shrewsbury. Okay, so I was in Shrewsbury, England. And, um, and so this was a big question. What, what is the legacy of Darwinism? And in the United Kingdom now, on the back of the money, you have the queen on one side and you have Saint, Sir, Charles on the other. Okay, so his, the, you know, this is a very important uh, figure, and his legacy is uh, something people were discussing. And I think most evolutionary biologists, uh, certainly most Darwinian evolutionary biologists, believe that Darwin's key legacy was not just the idea of evolution, the idea that things change over time, but it was the idea that things change over time in a particular way that they change under the influence of the undirected, unguided, mindless process of natural selection. And so the appearance of design that we see, all biologists recognize that living things give an appearance of the design. They look as though they were designed for a purpose, as Richard Dawkins says. But in the Darwinian view, that, perp that, that, that appearance is entirely illusory. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not real. Because there is an unguided, undirected mechanism, namely natural selection acting on random variations and mutations, which can produce the appearance of design without the mechanism being guided or directed in any way by any kind of intelligence. And so in Darwinism, you have this idea of apparent design, but not real design. And so many scholars, many historians of science, and many current evolutionary biologists will say that Darwin's key legacy is that he refuted the design argument. He showed that you could have design without a designer. Here's Francisco Ayala on that point. He says, it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living things can be explained as the result of a natural process, natural selection without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. Uh, Dawkins puts it very succinctly in The Blind Watchmaker. He says, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And again, the key word for a true Darwinian or neo-Darwinian is appearance. Okay? It's, it's, it's an illusion of design produced by an undirected process that can mimic the, the powers of a designing intelligence. Now, for a lot of people, that seems really counterintuitive, and it's and it's awfully hard to understand how you could affirm the appearance of design without design. But let me, let me go back to the origin of species. And, uh, and I think this is really important also for understanding debates that are going on within the religious world about whether Darwinian evolution is reconcilable with some form of theism. Um, because <clears throat> many people don't... You, you can have evolution... Evolution could be directed by an agent, okay? But the Darwinian mechanism is, uh, was formulated to supplant an agent. It's, it's a designer substitute. And I want to explain the logic of that, how that fall, fell out of the origin of species itself. In the 19th century, one of the most compelling evidences of design was the um, adaptation of organisms to their environment. I was, as a little kid, I was fascinated with fish. Whenever we'd go on fishing trips with my dad, I'd always get in trouble for... He said, Stephen, don't fondle the fish. And I was looking at him, you know, The swim bladder, you know, once you clean them out and all that. I was interested. Don't throw those guts away. That's interesting stuff. You know, but you look at fish. They have, the, they have gills and they extract oxygen from water. They've got fins. They, I mean, they're, they're perfectly adapted to an aquatic mode of life. Of birds live in the air. They have wings. Um, and so... The 19th century biologists, this fit, this match this, between the 
the, the, the features of an organism and the environment in which it lived was seen as a compelling evidence of design. And <clears throat> Darwin set out to explain that and in the process explain away the design hypothesis. And uh, this isn't one of his examples, but it's close to a number and it's an easy one to explain and it gets his idea across. So l imagine you're a sheep herder in the north of Scotland and you want to breed a woollier breed of sheep. What do you do? Well, the biologists for centuries have known, I mean, back to biblical times, they've known about what's called selective breeding. If you take the wooliest males and the wooliest females in the herd and only allow them to breed, you're going to get a little bit woollier offspring. And then you t if, among the offspring, if you take the wooliest males and the wooliest females again, and you keep doing that generation after generation, what are you going to get? You're going to get a, a woolier breed of sheep. So if you're uh, you know, in the far north of Scotland and you want to get a very woolly breed of sheep because you're in a cold climate, you can use selective breeding to enhance the, the fleece of, your, of, of your, your herd, your flock, your school. You don't have a school of sheep, I don't think. Uh, it's the fish. Okay, so <clears throat> anyway, so this is the the uh, is a well-known process. Now, Darwin came along and said, in effect, well, wait a minute. What if, instead of intentionally selecting those attributes, what if there was a series of very cold winters, an environmental change, such that in each generation, only the wooliest survived, and the, ones, the, the sheep without the really thick fur, uh, uh, fleece would die off? Wouldn't, after many generations of of very cold winters, wouldn't you end up in the very same position with a woolier overall flock of sheep? And in that case, then, you wouldn't have had any intelligent selection, any artificial selection, no input from an intelligence. You would have natural selection, an entirely natural effect. So, and this was his key insight, that nature can do what the breeder can do. Nature can do what the intelligent agent can do. And therefore, there's no need to invoke an intelligent agent to explain away adaptation, the key evidence of design. So he is not only explaining where you get new traits, he's explaining this appearance of design that has captured the fascination of biologists back to Aristotle. You feel the force of that argument? Okay, that, that's, what it, and that, that's, that's one of the reasons why Darwinism is so hard to reconcile with any meaningful form of design and therefore any theistic design. You can, have a, you can be a theistic evolutionist in the sense that God is causing change, but it's very hard to be a theistic Darwinist because even God can't direct an undirected process. And natural selection was formulated, the very logic of it is formulated as an undirected process, a mindless process, as opposed to the intelligence that's guiding, for example, artificial s selection and breeding. Okay? Now, the, that, that raises a lot of questions. First of all, is adaptation or is minor adaptation the only appearance of design in nature? And if not, has natural selection explained all the others? Now, in my talk this afternoon, I'm going to take this question up in a broader context, the context of contemporary neo-Darwinian evolutionary biology. And I'm going to argue that there are many reasons to doubt, even as a matter of biological evolution, that the modern neo-Darwinian version of Darwin's theory has explained away all appearances of design. Okay? But for right now, I want to focus more narrowly because I'm, in a sense, reprising the thesis of of book number one, of Signature in the Cell. And that's a book with a more narrowly focused thesis, which is just about the origin of the very first life. Because it's not, it's not widely recognized, but I mean, most scholars and biologists know this, Darwin did not address the question of the very first life. Let's put this in context with um, a figure, a, a diagram. This is his famous, is uh, the famous tree of life representation of the history of life. This is Darwin's picture of the history of life. This particular drawing was, was done by Ernst Haeckel, a German evolutionary biologist. But Dar basically Darwin's picture of the history of life was the idea that if you start with a single, organ a single simple organism, a one-celled organism, the process of natural selection acting on random variations would cause that organism to gradually morph and change into 
first slightly different organisms, and eventually the whole array of living forms we see today. So the top of the branches on the tree are all the forms of life we have today, and the trunk of the tree represents that first primordial organism from which everything else evolved and changed and developed. Now, what Darwin didn't address was where did that first organism come from? And in this talk, that's what I'd like to address. And I'd also li like to address a closely associated question, which is, do, does that first organism give any appearance of design? Because if, Darwin, if, because if it does, and Darwin didn't address the origin of that appearance of design, then it's at least possible that there is at least one appearance of design that is not explained away by the mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations, and we would now say mutations in modern neo-Darwinian theory. Okay? So what I want to look at is just that first question today. Is there any evidence of design, or is there an appearance of design at the, at the very base of the tree? And if so, has there been any undirected, unguided, materialistic process that has explained that appearance apart from an actual designing intelligence? That, so that's what we're going to look at. Okay. Now, in the 19th century, there was uh, not a whole lot of worry about that question. Darwin didn't address it, but he also wasn't terribly worried about um, the need to address it because most scientists at the time thought that the cell was an extremely simple entity. There was a theory about the cell called the protoplasmic theory. It was the idea that the essence of life is the protoplasmic substance, the goo that fills the cell membrane. And the idea was that with one or two very simple chemical reactions, you could produce that goo. And so uh, you have Ernst Haeckel saying uh, later, the cell is a simple homogeneous globule of plasm. Uh, T. A., uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's famous advocate, his bulldog, uh, said much the same thing. So this was the protoplasmic idea. Now there's a history of this idea. You know, it's, it took a while to un, uh, unravel and it did in stages. But by the 1950s, the idea that the cell was simple was just blown out of the water with something called uh, the molecular biological revolution. And it took, it took place in two tracks. Discoveries about what are called nucleic acids, molecules like DNA and RNA, and discoveries about molecules called proteins, and then further discoveries about how the two are interrelated. Let me talk first about the... The, the DNA track, because most of us are familiar with the famous discovery of Watson and Crick in 1953, in which they were able to el elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. And I have on the screen behind, good, my slides are in sync here, um, the, the, the structural formula of the DNA molecule with the famous double helix. And then the artist here has done a great job unpacking, showing what's on the inside of that double helix uh, along the side running up and down with little pentagons and peas. That's called the sugar phosphate backbone. And then along this interior of the molecule are the A's, the C's, the G's, and the T's, the nucleotide bases that actually convey the information for building proteins. And this was the, the further discovery of not so much Watson and Crick, but in this case, Crick himself. Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of the DNA molecule, but in 1957, Crick put forward a famous, now famous hypothesis called the sequence hypothesis, in which he posited, postulated, that those nucleotide bases are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a section of mach machine code, like the zeros and one in, in, in a section of computer code. That is to say, what's important about them is not their chemical structure or shape, but what's important is their arrangement. It's the specificity of arrangement, he, he proposed, that conveys instructions or information for building the proteins that people were also d learning about at, the, at this period of time. And the proteins which we now know are responsible for performing all the important biochemical reactions inside cells and building the structural parts. Proteins are the workhorses of the cell. And I've got a little, little illustration here of these of, of proteins. So you've got DNA in this 
digital format. It's, cryptogra or it's, it's typographic, is what one, one uh, scientist at MIT described it. And th that is, it's the arrangement of the characters, the, 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 the chemicals that function as characters that conveys information for then building these complex molecules called proteins that are kind of, you could think of proteins as kind of like the toolbox of the cell. And I've got an illustration here, some visual aids. These are snap lock blocks. And I stole them from my children when they were really small. They're in counseling about it now. And, uh, they, used to, they used to complain bitterly when they were little. Dad, do you have to take all our toys to college? You know, okay. So, okay, so proteins are made of, of smaller molecules, smaller subunits called amino acids. You've probably heard of those, okay? There are 20 different types of these amino acids. And depending upon the arrangement of the amino acids, different chemical forces are set in motion, and the interactions between those amino acids will cause these chains to fold into different shapes. That's what Doug Axe's talk was largely about. Last. He studies what are the protein folds, okay, really crucial structures. So if these fold right, then the proteins, these chains, will perform functions. If they're functional, we call them proteins, okay? So here's a picture of the amino acids, the, the chemical uh, formulas for the individual amino acids. You can see how they're linked together. There'll be a test on these formulas afterwards. And, and they form these interesting three-dimensional shapes. Now, if the shapes are right, then they, then they perform functions. For example, here's a, a just, you know, simplistic little uh, paper cutout kind of diagram of, of an enzyme that breaks apart a two-part sugar, a disaccharide. If the sugar fits or nestles into the grooves in the enzyme just right, then the enzyme is able to fa facilitate this reaction. And it will take place at a, a rate much, much faster than it would otherwise. So it's the, it, what's going on here is it's the three-dimensional fit of the protein with either other proteins or other molecules that allow it to pro perform its function. It's got a hand-in-glove fit, a three-dimensional fit. But that three-dimensional specificity of shape derives from the one-dimensional specificity of arrangement. In other words, you get these amino acids right, and they fold into the correct shape. If you change the, change the arrangement, they may not fold at all. Okay? You, get a, you get a protein that, that doesn't perform a function. So that specificity is crucial to proteins. Where does it come from? This was Crick's hypothesis. It comes from the, the specificity of arrangement in the DNA molecule. The information in DNA is responsible for the arrangement of amino acids, which are in turn responsible for the three-dimensional shape of the molecule. Okay? You get the, mo you get the shape right, then you got a function. Okay? Then you, then, and, and then you live. Then the, the cell lives. Okay? So, it turns out, it's a wonderful story um, of, of scientific progress in the 1950s and 60s, but Crick's sequence hypothesis was confirmed, not by a single experiment, but by a whole regime of things that were being done on both sides of the Atlantic as people pieced together what's called the gene expression system or the, the, the system of protein synthesis. And I, I can't tell that whole story today. That's the story Doug Axe told us, if you heard my introduction to him yesterday, in eight hours, but I do have something better. I have a little animation clip that shows you what scientists have discovered about essentially how a gene, how the information in a gene directs protein synthesis. And so I want to I show that to you right now. It's been called one of the wonders of the molecular world. An amazing nanoscale machine. ATP synthase is a high-tech micromolecular power generator inside the cells of your body. 
It generates adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, an energy molecule that provides fuel that every one of your cells needs to function. Without this fuel, your cells will cease operation, and so will you. ATP synthase works like a rotary engine. The barrel-shaped rotator is composed of 10 to 15 protein parts called subunits. The rotator spins around, transmitting mechanical energy into the drive shaft of the machine, which helps make ATP. This drive shaft has a specially placed bump that opens and closes parts as the drive shaft spins around. This bump opens special protein subunits on the bottom of the machine. When the bottom subunits open, a spent energy molecule called adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, enters the machine. The mechanical motion causes the ADP to bind with an additional phosphate group, creating the ATP energy molecule. And the ATP drifts off into the cell, ready to power some biomechanical reaction. The ATP synthase machine has many parts we recognize from human-designed technology. A rotor, a stator, a drive shaft, and other basic components of a rotary engine. The ATP synthase is one of thousands of elegantly designed molecular machines inside your cells that make your life and all known life possible. ATP synthase. An example of intelligent design. And that, uh, the discovery of not only the information bearing properties of DNA, but of the, inf the whole information processing system, just a tiny part of which we've seen in that animation, has created what I call the DNA enigma. And the DNA enigma is not the question of the structure of the DNA molecule. Watson and Crick did an amazing job uh, figuring that out. And it's a wonderful story of scientific uh, discovery. Uh, the DNA enigma is also not the question of where the biological information resides, or at least some of it. We know that a very important part of the information required to construct the, the, the parts of cells does reside along the, the, the spine of that double helix molecule in the, in, the, in the form of those nucleotide bases in their precise sequencing. The DNA enigma, the mystery of, of DNA, is not now even what the, the information in DNA does. We just saw an animation of that. By the way, for engineers who are perhaps familiar with the technology of CAD-CAM, this is very similar to this. At Boeing and in Seattle, they use digital code to direct the construction of mechanical parts in the factories, a common manufacturing te technology now. Um, and this is essentially what's going on inside the cell. You have digital information directing the construction of, of physical mechanical parts that perform important functions. But that's not the mystery either. We have, a, a, in, at least in rough outline, a pretty good idea of what's going on inside the cell, how those uh, crucial protein uh, parts of the cell are, are being constructed and how the information is directing that construction. What do you think the DNA enigma is? What is the mystery that this whole discovery raises? The informa where, does, where does it come from? Where does the information come from? Absolutely. And so that is the, that is the, the question that I took on in, in Signature in the Cell. Uh, John Lennox uh, mentioned uh, Bernd Olaf Kuffers in his talk. And I love his insight, and this is now an insight short, shared by many uh, scientists working on the problem of the origin of the first life, sometimes called origin of life researchers, sometimes called origin of life biochemists, sometimes people working on the theory of chemical evolution, a theory which is, I would say now, almost universally acknowledged to be in a state of impasse. It's not explaining what needs to be explained, and the crucial thing that needs to be explained is the origin of the information that is running the show inside the cell, inside the uh, um, formerly, allegedly simple cell. Okay, it's not simple. And here's what Cooper says. He says, the problem of the origin of life is basically equivalent to the problem of the origin of biological information. Now, 
Um, for scientists and engineers, um, yeah, let, let's, here, here's a way, another way into this. I used to ask my students, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? Yeah, you got, I'm hearing several answers. Code, software, okay, in, information, all right, all those are correct. It, it, another way to understand what Kupers is saying is that that same thing is true of living organisms. If you want to build life in the first, if you want to build a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form, which is what I'll be talking about after lunch, you've got to have an, an informational input. John Lennox has been talking about you know, informational inputs and how critical they are to understanding what's going on in life. But it's also true if you want to build life in the first place. You've got to have those DNA molecules full of specifically arranged nucleotide bases, not just nucleotide bases arranged in any old way. You've got to have them arranged in an informational way so they convey precise instructions for building these intricate structures we call proteins and protein machines. The crucial thing to understand about DNA is when you look at these two strings of characters, we don't just have a complex or improbable string of characters like the one on the top. We have a string of characters in which the arrangement of characters is specific to perform a function. It's informational more in the sense that most of us recognize information as having meaning or function. And these sequences in DNA perform a communication function. They direct the, the, the construction of these crucial physical systems, these, these, these mechanical parts called proteins. Something that is precisely arranged with respect to the, the requirements, the functional requirements of an organism. To view this program again and share it with your friends and to learn more about this series, these conferences, and the intersection of science and faith, please go to www.pensmore.org. The proceeding was brought to you by the Pensmore Foundation and NRB-TV.